uh, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for coming to listen to me. It is the 60th anniversary of the Republic's independence. And as a citizen of former colony, I know how important this uh, independence is. And yeah, I, you know, let's uh, make it clear, I, I don't believe in some foreigner flying in for two days and telling people what to do. So I'm not going to really tell you what to do, but I'm going to provoke you into challenging some conventional wisdom. I'm going to give you some examples from the past and more recent times to serve as a stimulus at, uh, for a debate. So that please uh, don't think that I'm trying to lecture you on how to run the country. Too many people have done that. Well, the, as uh, <coughs> Charles was saying, uh, in 1961, a few years after Ghana's independence and when my native country, South Korea, started this industrialization drive, we had $90 per capita income and actually that uh, according to, I mean this is also the World Bank source, uh, maybe I misread the number but you know, the, the, in the same year Ghana had uh, 190, okay, 190, 150 really doesn't matter. I mean, anyway, the, the numbers from those times are rather disputed, but, you know, the, basically that was the picture. You know, Ghana was basically the, the one level. And 40, sorry, the, the four and a half decades later, we had a complete reversal of fortune. And as Charles also mentioned, Ghana was considered a country with good development prospect with a charismatic leader, while that infamous internal memo in the USAID described South Korea as a bottomless pit. So how did this happen? Well, there's a popular explanation given by Samuel Huntington who wrote that controversial book called The Clash of Civilizations. And he basically goes, you know, South Koreans value thrift, investment, hard work, education, organization, and discipline. Ghanaians had different values. Well, they valued being lazy. They didn't value education. You know, you get the picture. Basically, this is saying that Ghana didn't develop as well as South Korea did because there's something wrong with the Ghanaians. Eh? No, really, according to this interpretation, unless Ghana can put everyone in a cultural re-education camp, uh, like the Khmer Rouge did, and change the way people think completely, Ghana will never develop. Eh? Well, the, the Charles told me about this milk story that, you know, uh, I never heard it, but, uh, you know, that one very easy way of uh, the point that, that undermining that, that story is uh, to say that most East Asians are actually lactose intolerant. Yeah? <laughs> so we are genetically programmed not to imbibe milk, huh? QED, you know. So I've given you a weapon uh, to, yeah, uh, hit these uh, people with, uh, yeah? Anyway, it's uh, not just culture, I mean, it's milk, you know, it's uh, climate, it's geography, it's you know, the natural resources, it's ethnic diversity, institutions, everything. I mean, this uh, the, the, the kind of explanation of underdevelopment has been very popular in relation to Africa, although it does apply to some other parts of the developing world. 
this uh, discourse uh, is known as the African Growth Tragedy Discourse. And, you know, I mean, there, there are so many arguments. Yeah? So when it comes to climate, they say tropical diseases reduce uh, the labor productivity. You know, tropical soil is quite poor in nutrients and it will lead to low agriculture yield. Many African countries are landlocked. I mean, it doesn't apply to this country. But uh, being landlocked is very bad for economic development because you cannot trade uh, very easily. Yeah? People also have talked about bad neighbor effects. If you are surrounded by countries that are poor and conflict-ridden, it's not going to be good for your development. Yeah? Because of the, A, you have uh, the, uh, very little uh, to sell to your neighbors, and B, the neighbors' conflicts are going to spill into your own borders. People have talked about the natural resource curse. Basically, the argument is that uh, having abundant natural resources lead to corruption, conflicts, and overvaluation of currency that uh, restricts uh, the, the export competitiveness. People have talked about the, the problem with the ethnic diversity. It is said that especially medium degrees of ethnic diversity is uh, the bad. Yeah? Because uh, if you have uh, like one dominant group or lots of uh, the little different groups like in say Tanzania, it's uh, difficult to organize into kind of conflicting blocks. But if you have two, three, four, five groups, then it's uh, easier. So it, uh, this is uh, supposed to be bad for economic development. And then these people will point out that uh, East Asia had the ethnic homogeneity and that's why they develop. I mean, that's bullshit. Yeah? No, let me tell you, I mean, Korea might be ethnically homogeneous, but uh, not other countries. Eh? And, uh, Japan has uh, many minority groups, uh, including Koreans uh, who settled down there uh, during the colonial times. You know, Taiwan, you think, well, I mean, they all look Chinese, but, you know, they have uh, two, depending on how you divide them, four distinct ethnic groups who don't speak the same language. I mean, they share the script. I mean, you know, the unique thing about the Chinese script is uh, that each symbol stands for a meaning. So even without uh, understanding the verbal communication, you can understand uh, what people are saying. But actually, these uh, people, you know, uh, the, these uh, the, the so-called mainlanders, yeah, uh, the, who are basically northern Chinese people who came with the nationalist government after the, the, their defeat to the communists in 1949. There are the so-called Taiwanese who are descendants of immigrants from Southeast China, the, the Fujian and those other places, and they hate each other. Yeah? Well, actually, they had a race riot in 1947. Yeah? Because the Chinese people didn't like these uh, mainlanders. Yeah? Anyway, I mean, that, I could go on, but that, uh, you, know, you see my point. People have they even talked about uh, institutions being part of this, uh, what I call meta structural factors. You know, that these are not structural in the sense that, you know, they, they can be over the long term change. Yeah? So you change your economic structure, you, you grow your manufacturing sector, and its uh, share grows and so on. Uh, this uh, doesn't happen overnight. So that it's uh, structural, but uh, the, it can be changed. I call these uh, things meta-structure because these things are supposed to be unchangeable, more or less. You know? So the, the people have argued that high risk of death, uh, basically because of uh, tropical diseases, Made, it, made the European colonizers to bring over extractive ins institutions, low quality institutions that are only geared uh, towards uh, extracting resource from their colonies because they had no intention of settling. Yeah? I mean, it was too dangerous for them to settle. Yeah? Whereas in the US, in the New Zealand, you know, climate was uh, more hospitable, so they brought uh, the institutions uh, that uh, at a good institution because uh, they had to, you know, meant to settle there and uh, 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 live with those institutions. Eh? There are so many of these arguments, it's uh, actually quite uh, difficult to believe uh, that 
mean, that, that there's any point in the, the learning any economics, right? Because if uh, these factors uh, determine countries' uh, the destiny, what's the point, you know? Anyway, but uh, the, if you look at these arguments uh, more closely, they all kind of fall apart. First of all, all the meta-structural factors have been there more or less throughout Africa's uh, post-independence period, but the continent's growth performance has fluctuated uh, quite widely. So in the 1960s and 70s, okay, Africa wasn't uh, doing great, but basically the, the, the per capita income in the continent grew nearly the, the, the by 2% per, the, the per year. And then you had the disaster in the 80s and 90s, per capita income falling at the rate of 0.7% per year, and then the, the picking up again the, the to just over two percent in the, the since the 2000s. You know, if uh, these uh, meta structural factors are so important, these kind of things uh, that shouldn't happen. Yeah, Africa should have had uh, low growth all the time. No, but it wasn't like that. Also, individual experiences of African nations counter the meta structural argument. Two of Africa's best growth performers, named Ethiopia and Rwanda, are actually landlocked. Even more interestingly, Ethiopia started growing much faster after becoming landlocked. Yeah? Because they lost the coastline when the Eritrea seceded yeah, in the 90s. Yeah? But the uh, Ethiopian economy that, that picked up, and actually in the last uh, 15 years or so, per capita income in Ethiopia has been growing faster than in China. You didn't know that, did you? Yeah? I mean, of course, it's uh, from a very low base, uh, so it's uh, the easier to grow faster when you have very low income, but this is a remarkable achievement, and all that happened after it became landlocked. Yeah? So there goes uh, the, the theory of uh, the, uh, <coughs> geography. Yeah? Even more interestingly, many of these uh, metastructural factors have been present in today's developed countries. As you all know, Singapore has a tropical climate. So why did that not uh, prevent the, the country from uh, developing? And also, the Scandinavian countries, Canada, and parts of the US have Arctic and frigid climate, which are also hostile to economic development. No, you know, in the, the, those are the climates, you know, engines freeze up. I mean, rubricants that, that, that don't work. You know, you have to actually heat the, the machines while you are the, making them work. Uh, there's a very limited period of time when you can do work outside. And you have to run huge uh, the, the <coughs> heating and electricity bills that are for your factories because uh, during the winter time it's uh, so cold and days are short. Hmm? So who says that, that those climates are actually good for economic development? I'm not sure that the weather is actually worse than the, the, the tropical climate in terms of economic development. Switzerland and Austria, two of the richest economies, are landlocked. If you're interested in being landlocked as an explanation of underdevelopment, the Scandinavian countries used to be landlocked half the year before they invented the ice-breaking ships in the late 19th century. No, basically, sea would uh, freeze for half the year, and they would have no access to sea. So how did they develop, if uh, the being landlocked is that, that's, uh, such a burden? The US, Canada, and Australia are very well endowed with natural resources, far better than almost all the African countries. I said that with the possible exceptions of DRC and South Africa, but I mean, as far as uh, the, what is known today, I mean, these countries are not as uh, the well endowed as uh, the US, Canada, and Australia. Yeah, maybe they will be in the future because uh, the, these countries have uh, potentials uh, buried underground, but you know, basically, that, that you know. Except for those two countries, other African countries uh, cannot even 
come closer to the US, Canada, and Australia in terms of uh, being rich in natural resources. Switzerland, Belgium, Taiwan, they have all have wrong degrees of ethnic divisions in the sense that there are two groups far worse than the, the African ones today. I, mean, I cannot go into the details, but I'm happy to supply you with uh, some details if you want. And finally, when it comes to culture, before their economic successes, the Germans, the Japanese, and the Koreans were described as lazy, overly emotional, living for today, uncooperative, and even mentally slow. Yeah, let me give you the, some examples. Uh, this is uh, the, what the British traveler said about the, the Germans, yeah? clothing, easily contented people, endowed neither with great acuteness of perception, nor quickness of feeling. Well, why do you bother? You could have just said that they are stupid. Yeah? <laughs> you know, the, 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 I'm not showing it that here, but the Mary Shelley, the famous author of the, the famous book uh, Frankenstein, in her travel diary in Germany in the 1930s, put it very simply, she said, Germans never hurry. Yeah, she had a fight with her coach driver. At the invitation of the Japanese government, who wanted him to give some advice on improving productivity in Japanese factories. Well, once again, he's uh, mincing his words, but basically, you know, the, 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 he was saying, your workers are hopeless, uh, the lazy bones. I can uh, help you. you know. And I, I, I try to uh, point this out to the managers. They throw their hands in the air and say, this is habits of natural heritage. Yeah? Japanese are born that way. Yeah? Well, once again, in my book, uh, the, the Bad Samaritans, I have many more quotes about what Westerners said about uh, the Japanese uh, the, in the late 19th and early 20th century. And finally, the, the cream of the crop, uh, did you say, comes from uh, Beatrice Webb, uh, the, one of the founders of uh, Fabian Socialism and some sort of proto-feminist. But uh, about my ancestors, uh, she had these things to say. 12 millions of dirty, degraded, sullen, lazy, and religionless savages who slouch about in dirty white garments of the most inept kind and who live in filthy mud huts. Yeah? Well, there you go. I mean, if uh, this is a uh, proto feminist uh, socialist, yeah? I mean, you can imagine what the typical uh, Edwardian gentleman would have uh, said about uh, my ancestors. Yeah? <laughs> Well, basically, the point is that, that you know, culture, in large part, because of the changes in the way people live, yeah? their material conditions, yeah? that, that, that this issue of timekeeping. Yeah? So when the, the people from rich countries go to developing countries, they say, oh, they don't keep time. You know? They have no sense of time. I mean, that was what the Australians were uh, talking about, the Japanese. Yeah? Yes, I mean, that, that is... Uh, factually correct, but why are people not keeping time? Not because they are kind of inherently lazy, but because they don't have to keep time, given the way the society is organized. You know, you work in your field, you know, you had a bit too much to drink last night, you got up 30 minutes late, you go to your field 30 minutes late, and you come back 30 minutes late. You know? No big deal. But if you're working in a factory, you know, everyone has to be there at 8.45, otherwise the production line won't run. You know? So the people naturally develop this habit of uh, keeping time because they work in factories rather than in fields. Yeah? Also, when you become richer, time becomes uh, relatively more precious because uh, the supply of time is limited. Uh, there are only 24 hours in a day. Yeah? At least so far, no one has invented a time extender, yeah, which uh, the, I think the rich people can uh, buy and uh, the, the live uh, the 48 hours per day. So uh, as uh, the, your material wealth grows, uh, time becomes more precious. Yeah, yeah so the, uh, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, they, until then, 
there existed this uh, expression in Korea called the Korean time. Yeah? I mean, probably the younger generation Koreans haven't even heard of this expression. But this basically meant that you can expect people to be laid up to, say, one and a half hours when they have appointments. Yeah? And the one that criticizes you, you don't have to apologize. Yeah? Today, the expression doesn't even exist. Because everyone uh, lives a very organized life, time is precious, everyone's uh, got, well, the, not just one, the probably two mobile phones, you know. Mobile phones uh, work even in underground. So uh, you don't even have the classic excuse of, oh, I was stuck in a traffic jam, yeah? No, I mean, uh, now people keep time very, very well. Yeah? But only 20 years ago, a lot of Koreans, including myself, 25 years ago, thought this was in our genes, not keeping time. Anyway, so that, that all this uh, the meta structure explanation, which are supposed to hold the uh, Ghana and other African countries back, are not really important things. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying that all of them are completely wrong. Some of these things matter, and you know. Uh, the, some of these things uh, may, in some occasions, be important, but overall, these are secondary factors. Eh? Now, if the explanation of African economic underdevelopment, based on these uh, growth inhibiting metastructural factors, are unconvincing, we can only conclude that it is uh, the policies that make the difference. But well, what are these uh, policies that promote economic development? Of course, uh, the standard answer is that they are free market, free trade policies. Of course, that uh, in this country, once having been a uh, supposed uh, success story of the structural adjustment program, people should know that uh, these policies don't quite work. And as uh, the Charles was uh, the, the implying earlier, the so-called miracle economies of East Asia, such as Japan, South Korea, Thailand, and Singapore, haven't developed on the basis of these uh, free market, free trade policies. They use uh, very interventionist uh, trade and industrial policies to artificially promote uh, manufacturing industries. For a while, the people didn't quite believe it, so actually, like myself, on the other hand, about the nature of East Asian economic development. Now, most people admit that, yes, that, that these countries didn't develop, but through free trade, free market policies, and probably most of you know, but let me give you a couple of uh, interesting examples uh, to liven up uh, the discussion. In 1958, Japan tries to export its uh, first passenger cars to the United States. The car was called Toyo Pet, and as you can guess from the name, it is a cheap, small, more of a four wheels and an ashtray kind of a car that was so cheap that Toyota hoped that uh, prosperous American consumers would uh, pick them up with uh, changes left over from their grocery shopping. Yeah? Unfortunately, it was a total flaw. Yeah? Cheap it may have been, but it looked like this. Would you buy that? Yes. I wouldn't. So, Toyota decided to officially withdraw the product from the market. Some of you must have seen this movie, Men in Black. Yeah? The neuralizer, yeah, so Toyota was saying that, yeah? The product was never here, you know. And then a huge debate that, that uh, ensued in Japan. The free market economies are centered around the central bank, the Bank of Japan, argued that, you see, this is what happens when we go against the received economic wisdom. There is this economic theory called the theory of comparative advantage that says that a uh, labor abundant country like Japan, who's uh, actually not try to make uh, capital intensive products like cars. And how do you think uh, that we can go against the theory? 
And indeed, the Japanese car industry was a joke at the time. In 1955, a few years uh, before, uh, the Toyota debacle, all the 11, 12, I forget the exact number, Japanese car producers put together a year. In the same year, General Motors alone was producing 3.5 million cars. The U.S. auto industry as a whole was producing 7 million cars, exactly 100 times that of Japan. Yeah, yeah so the, just imagine if I took a time machine and went back to 1955, doesn't matter where, I mean, it could be Japan, could be the U.S., uh, could be Ghana, and told people, you know, there's this uh, the tiny cars, but you know what? In 50 years' time, it will be the biggest car company in the world. They probably would have put me in a psychiatric uh, hospital. <laughs> Free market uh, economists also pointed out that, look, we have to keep this up. I mean, it's not as if we haven't been protecting and uh, subsidizing this company huh? and then other automobile companies. Huh? Indeed, uh, since it was uh, first uh, set up in 1933, the Japanese uh, the car industry was uh, the, the protected with the very high tariffs. When the, the Japanese government kicked out the Ford and General Motors in 1938, until that time, they were the dominant uh, producers, but in the build-up to the Pacific War, uh, the Japanese uh, government kicked out all the American companies. Since uh, they did that, there was a, well, basically a ban on the foreign direct investment in the automobile industry, so the Japanese producers had the markets uh, to themselves. Yeah? And the, the economists from the Bank of Japan are especially pleased uh, to point out that don't forget, back in 1949, we, the Bank of Japan, bailed Toyota out of bankruptcy because uh, the, you just uh, couldn't uh, the, the survive. Huh? So they said, 25 years of uh, high tariff protection, 20 years of uh, ban on foreign direct investment, public bailout, what more do you need? Yeah? You still cannot make a car that, that, that can sell in the, even the lowest uh, segment of the American market. Forget about this. Yeah? Well, today, you know, we think uh, Japanese cars are as natural as, I don't know, the French wine or Scottish salmon. But only 60 years ago, many people, including many Japanese themselves, uh, thought that the industry has uh, no justification to exist in Japan. Yeah? Well, luckily for Japan, and I would say the, for the rest of the world, which that, uh, has uh, the subsequently benefited, uh, from better cars are made in Japan or made by Japanese companies. The protection is prevailed and the Japanese uh, government continued with its uh, support for the industry and the rest is history, as they say. This is how Japanese cars uh, look like these days. So, when you meet a free trade economist next time, Ask him what car he drives. If he's driving a Japanese car, or for that matter, a Korean car, which was uh, developed in the same, uh, with the same method, he doesn't know what he's talking about, okay? Another striking example is POSCO, the Korean steel maker, which is uh, today the fourth largest uh, company, steel making company in the world. You know, the company was uh, set up in 1968, when South Korea's per capita income was uh, less than 5% that of the U.S. Yeah? And when the, the South Korean government at the time tried to get a loan from our international consortium to build a steel mill, the World Bank, which was advising that consortium, said you shouldn't lend this money. Yeah? I mean, the, a country like uh, Korea has no business in uh, making things like steel. Yeah? And they have to import most of the raw materials anyway, and this government is proposing to set it up as a state-owned enterprise because uh, that they say no private sector that the investors are willing to take the risk. And how do you expect this company to work? I mean, they are going against all the received wisdom in economics. Well, the Koreans persevered. Uh, they built this uh, steel mill with 
basically colonial migration uh, from Japan. And yeah, initially I had to provide a lot of uh, protection and subsidies, but uh, within 20 years of uh, uh, the being established, uh, it became one of the most uh, efficient steel making companies in the world. I, mean, I can give you many examples like this uh, from Korea, from Japan, from Taiwan, but you get the point. You know? Now, when I do that, however, a lot of people say, yeah, but that's uh, the East Asians, you know, I mean, that's uh, the people who eat uh, rice with chopsticks. Yeah? <laughs> All the other rich countries became rich through free trade and free market policies. You know, look at the United States, uh, look at the Britain. Yeah? However, this is uh, simply not true. From 18th century Britain down to you know, the late 20th century Korea and Taiwan, most of uh, the today's rich countries developed their economies initially with protection, subsidies, and other forms of government intervention. Let's uh, start with the beginning. You know, until the 17th century, Britain was actually a backward raw material producer. Its main export was wool from sheep, and it was uh, exporting it to then uh, the high-tech centers of Europe, the low countries, what uh, Belgium and the Netherlands today, especially Flanders, which was at the time the central woolen manufacturing, which was in those days the high-tech industry of Europe. Now, of course, uh, the uh, British uh, uh, were not happy with this because you know, they knew that, 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 that you have to get into processing the raw material and manufacturing things out of it to get uh, the high value. So when this man, the, Robert Walpole, commonly known as the first British uh, Prime Minister, uh, although his uh, official title was the Chief Minister, uh, uh, came to power in 1721, he launched a trade and industrial policy program that were intended to promote uh, less developed uh, British manufacturing industries, especially the woolen manufacturing uh, industry, woolen textile manufacturing industry, against uh, superior continental competition. And actually, if you the, the look at his policies, these are from uh, the 1908 book uh, by an American uh, business uh, historian, uh, Nicholas uh, Briscoe, who later became the dean of uh, business school in NYU. And he documented uh, Walpole's uh, policies uh, in this book. And there's a striking similarity between the, his policies and what the, the, the East Asian countries are later used. I mean, uh, policies uh, like tariff rebates on inputs used for exporting, I thought that was invented in Japan in the 1950s. No, this was uh, invented in Britain, actually even before World War time, yeah, although he extended it. And in between the World War program and the 1850s, Britain was a very, very protectionist uh, the economy. I mean, look at this. I mean, the, in these early days, uh, the data are rather scant, but uh, for countries where you can get the data, basically you see that yeah, uh, even until the early 19th century, Britain had the highest average manufacturing tariff rate. Yeah? So Britain didn't invent the, the, the free trade. It actually invented the protectionism. This is why the 19th century German economist Friedrich List accused the British of uh, kicking away the ladder when it recommended free trade policies to the Germans and the Americans. And at the time, the Germans and the Americans very much identified with, with each other as uh, the kind of uh, challenges uh, to British economic supremacy. And what is he saying? I mean, he's saying, look, I mean, the British uh, tell us, uh, the Germans and the Americans, not to artificially protect uh, our industries, but 
but to the, the auto free trade. But when you actually look at British history, when did they use free trade policy? Never. Which was uh, true at least at the time. So it, uh, this is like someone climbing up to the top. You don't need to read this. Uh, it's all summarized in this uh, cartoon on the cover of my earlier book. Uh, uh, this is like someone climbing up to the top with a ladder and kicking the ladder away so that other people can follow. Now, if uh, Britain was uh, the country that invented uh, protectionism, the con country that invented the theory to justify it was the United States. The theory was uh, invented by an American who is so famous that most of you even know what he looks like, even though he's been dead for over 200 years, well, except that you don't know who he is. Yeah? You would recognize his face, but you wouldn't know who he is. It's this guy. On the ten dollar bill, Alexander Hamilton, who was the first treasury secretary or the finance minister, as uh, he would be called in other countries, of the United States of America. Now, Hamilton became the U.S. Treasury Secretary at the outrageously young age of uh, 33 in 1891 when uh, the George Washington the, the was uh, the first uh, elected president, sorry, 1791, uh, yeah, uh, the, the elected the, the president and appointed the, the first ever U.S. cabinet. Two years after that, he submitted a report to the U.S. Congress called the Report of the Treasury Secretary on the subject of manufacturers, he presented his long-term development vision for the country in which he developed a theory which is today known as the theory of infant industry protection. Now, in order to explain this idea intuitively, in my book, Bad Samaritans, I have a chapter called My Six-Year-Old Son Should Get a Job. Now, well, I mean, of course, uh, children have this annoying habit of growing up, and now he's 17, but he really was uh, six when I wrote the book. And I start the chapter by saying, I have this uh, six-year-old son, well, of course, I don't use uh, such uh, the strong words uh, in the, the, the book, but I essentially say, well, he's a parasite. Huh? No, I pay for everything, you know, his uh, food, his lodging, his education, his health care, his uh, TV, you know, his uh, Nintendo games, you know. And then I got thinking, hang on a second. Why, when you go to Ghana, when you go to Peru, there are children who work from the age of four or five. You know, British children used to work from the age of four or five in the old days. So why can't he work? That will save me a lot of money. And then I realized that this is a win-win situation. Yeah? Because not only will I save a lot of money, but this guy will become a very competitive person. Yeah? You know, no more wasting his time with his, uh, his Nintendo games. I mean, he'll be you know, practicing his whatever trade that uh, skills uh, that, that he'll be uh, selling, you know, the, the shoe shining, you know, chewing gum selling, you know. Women, the, the, so why don't I do that? For that matter, why don't other people do that? You know, I mean, this is a win-win. You know, the parents save money, the boy becomes uh, competitive in the labor market. Yeah? Mm -hmm. You didn't think about that, did you? <laughs> I don't know about other people, but uh, my reasoning was, well, this kid's quite clever. You know, if I invested him, I invested in him uh, for another 12, 15 years. You know, he could become lots of things. You know. Uh, the neurosurgeon, nuclear physicist, architect. Of course, uh, there's a good chance that this guy will turn out to be a waste of time. Eh? <laughs> you know, he could uh, just uh, get my protection, get my subsidies, and then do nothing. Eh? But, you know, my reasoning was, well, even if uh, there's a uh, 50 chance of that, I'll still do that because I mean, there's a 50% ch uh, chance that uh, he might become a neurosurgeon, but if I kick him into the labor market today, he will never. 
Yeah, so I'm but, uh, willing to make that bet. I'm not going to kick him into the labor market. In sum, this is the logic of infant industry protection. Today, of course, it doesn't make profit. Today is a drain on resource. But unless you invest in it, in the future, you are not going to get the productive industries. Now, this is a very simple but very powerful idea. But you know, in recommending this, Alexander Hamilton was going against the advice of uh, the father of economics, Adam Smith, who said explicitly in his famous book, Wealth of Nations, Americans should not try to artificially develop manufacturing industries. It is bad for them. Given this, it was uh, no surprise that uh, few Americans were convinced by Hamilton's argument, you know, especially Thomas Jefferson, Hamilton's uh, political arch enemy, argued, look, this is insane. You know, we can export our cotton, export our tobacco, of course uh, he omitted a part about the slaves, yeah? export them to Europe and buy manufactured products that are not even not just better, but also cheaper. Why should we subsidize these Yankee manufacturers? Yeah? yeah, and a lot of other people said, yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah, why should we? Yeah? Well, until, I mean, the public opinion started to turn, and especially after the, the Anglo-American War of uh, 1812, which so far is uh, the, the only war in which uh, the U.S. was invaded uh, in its uh, mainland. And after that, a lot of uh, the Americans said, no, actually, the, probably Hamilton was right. I mean, by then he was dead, uh, killed in a pistol duel. And uh, the slowly they the started introducing uh, the protectionism. And by the 1830s, it was the most protected country in the world. And, uh, going back to this table again, I mean, you cannot quite see it, but uh, basically the, uh, by the 1820s, it was uh, already pretty high. By the 1830s, when the, the British uh, the protection started uh, coming down, the U.S. became literally the most protected economy in the world. Now, some of you might be wondering, what is the, that guy jabbering about? That's not the world. There are only about uh, 15 yeah. Western countries plus Japan. I mean, that, that has uh, living in Europe, but uh, for so long made a guy that uh, oblivious of the, the fact that there are lots of other countries. No, uh, that is not that uh, case. Because uh, for most of the period covered by this table, countries that do not appear in this uh, table did not have the right to set their own tariffs. Eh? They were either colonies, or if the, they were nominally independent, like uh, China, or Thailand, or Egypt, or the, the Turkey, they were forced to sign the so-called unequal treaties in which uh, they were deprived of the right uh, to set their own tariffs. Eh? I mean, this also applied to the Latin American countries between the 1810s and the 1870s. Actually, these uh, unequal treaties were initially invented uh, for the Latin Americans. Eh? Basically, the treaties were saying, well, you are not quite our equal, so we are not going to the, the let you set uh, your own tariffs. Uh, you will impose a 3 or 5% flat rate tariff, and you will not uh, have the right to try our own citizens, because uh, we don't trust your judicial system, and so on. Anyway, and, and uh, after that, it was uh, applied to China and many other countries. So actually, the other countries that do not appear in this table, the, which had the right to set its own tariffs, uh, that uh, were <coughs> Norway, which was uh, the same country with Sweden until 1905, and Portugal, which uh, was also that uh, actually at least as far as uh, the Britain was concerned, was uh, forced to sign unequal treaties. So anyway, I mean, uh, basically this is just about the whole of the world when it comes to tariff setting, and from this uh, table that uh, you can uh, see that, that uh, from about 1830s until this end of the Second World War, for about 120 years, the U.S. was the most protected 
economy in the world most of the time, and not always. No? There were some exceptions, like uh, the, the early Franco days in Spain and the, the, the pre-revolution in Russia in the early 20th century. So you already see that uh, there is something quite jarring about the history of capitalism as you know it, and the real history of capitalism. And let me just uh, the, the, the show you a few more uh, the other pieces of information. You know, uh, trade policy basically. Um, all of uh, today's rich countries, except for the Netherlands and Switzerland before World War I, used uh, protectionism for substantial periods. As I keep telling you, Britain and the US, the supposed homes of free trade, were much more pro protectionist than other countries. And interestingly, even when their average tariff was uh, not so high, these countries often provided high protection for strategic industries. So, you know, the, there are some examples in the late 19th, early 20th century, Germany and Sweden, their average tariff might have been around 20%, much lower than in the US, but they provided very high protection for certain uh, segments of the so-called heavy and chemical industries. Belgium in the mid-19th century had only 10% average tariff rate, but uh, offered 30 to 60% to textile, 85% for iron. Yeah, so the 10% average means that uh, many other sectors were not protected at all, but you know, they gave uh, selective uh, protection. Foreign direct investment, you know, most of uh, rich countries are the, today regulated uh, foreign direct investment when they were at the receiving end of uh, this. So, you know, the U.S. Uh, very heavily regulated uh, foreign direct investment, uh, mostly in the services and uh, the natural resources, because at the time, <coughs> manufacturing was uh, relatively rare. But, you know, the, the, as you see from there, the, the, the <clears throat> in 1885, they had uh, this law prohibiting import of foreign workers in the, the foreign-owned manufacturing facilities. You know, only American citizens could become directors uh, in a national bank, and foreign shareholders were not even allowed to vote in annual general shareholders meetings. You know, if uh, any developing country that, that, that tried uh, a trick like this, that uh, probably the, the U.S. Uh, will declare a war. <laughs> Japan and Korea and Taiwan to a lesser extent virtually banned foreign direct investment until the 1980s. Finland classified all firms with more than 20% foreign ownership as dangerous enterprises. I didn't invent the term. It's an official Finnish term between the 1830s and the 1980s. Uh, 18, uh, sorry, 1930s and the 1980s and uh, the foreigners got the subtle hint and kept away. State ownership, a uh, similar story, you know, Germany and Japan kick-started industrialization by setting up uh, state-owned enterprises which were at the time known as model factories. So when they wanted to promote new industries, like textile, steel, shipbuilding, they would uh, set up this uh, state-owned company, uh, but that, uh, run it uh, to you know, the introduce new technologies, train the new workers, uh, the, the create the managers with experience, and then the probably privatize the company. Yeah. Uh, so that was uh, the quite frequently used in those countries. After the Second World War, many developed countries, France, Finland, Austria, Norway, Taiwan, Singapore, extensively used the, the state-owned enterprises. So, you know, most of the French firms that you have ever heard of are either still state-owned or the, well, state-owned until very recently. Singapore is a very interesting case. You know, the, when you hear about the Singapore, you will typically only hear about this uh, free trade policy. 
and it's a welcoming attitude towards uh, foreign investors, which it has. Yeah? But you will never be told that 90% of land in Singapore is owned by the government. 85% of housing is provided by government-owned housing corporation, and a staggering 22% of GDP, this is uh, the, literally the highest uh, in the capitalist world, uh, outside the oil producing countries, 22% of GDP is uh, produced by state-owned enterprises, including the famous Singapore Airlines. Eh? So actually, I uh, often challenge my graduate students. Give me one economic theory, it doesn't matter what it is, neoclassical, Keynesian, Marxist, one economic theory that can explain Singapore single-handedly. No, there is no such theory. You know, this is a, a, a very important point. You know, the world does not work according to textbook economics. I mean, of course, uh, economic theories uh, help you to understand what's going on. I'm not rejecting theories, but you know, all these theories are that, 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 that set up in a very particular way with uh, lots of hidden assumptions. So the real world success stories very often involve uh, defining some received theory and combining totally different theories. You know? I mean, who would have invented uh, something like Singapore if uh, that, uh, he was given a free reign yeah? with a piece of paper? Yeah? No, no one would have. Yeah? Because that, uh, on one hand, it's that, that totally socialist, you know, 90% of the land are owned by the government. You know, one interesting uh, implication is that uh, Singapore's famously low tax is possible only because the government gets so much revenue from being the landlord. You know? Anyway, so you know, on the one hand you have that, on the other hand you have uh, the free trade. Yeah? They didn't use uh, that, that, that protectionism like uh, South Korea or Japan. Yeah? So I mean, this is that uh, what you have to uh, think like. Yeah? I mean, we have become slaves of the uh, economic theories. Yeah? We have but, uh, become slaves of uh, the policy recommendations by you know famous economists and the World Bank and the United Nations. No, I mean that, that uh, successful countries. Have yeah listened to this, you know, but made their uh, they made up uh, their own mind, you know, devised their own policies, charted their own way. You know. In the U.S., uh, state-owned enterprises account for only about one percent of GDP, but it has had one of the most successful state-owned enterprises in human history. Except this is uh, not called a state-owned enterprise; it's called U.S. military. <laughs> No, it's actually amazing how in just about all areas in which uh, the Americans have uh, technological leadership, in the beginning there was the U.S. military supporting research. Yeah? Computer and internet were developed by the Pentagon. Semiconductor, this is a uh, little known, but uh, initially was uh, the, the totally funded by the U.S. Navy. Aircraft from the U.S. Air Forces, you know, iPhone, you know, my friend uh, Mariana Masukato became famous uh, for writing this article pointing out how just about every single piece of technology contained in an iPhone initially was developed by U.S. military research. So the history of uh, capitalism is a bit like this. You know? uh, this is uh, the pictures from early days of uh, the Russian Revolution, uh, there's Lenin, and there's uh, Trotsky, and these guys are called Kamenev, uh, the, who is uh, little known these days, but he was a big fish at the time, you know, he was uh, the editor of uh, the party paper Pravda for a while, he was married to the Trotsky's uh, sister, you know, he was uh, the, a powerful guy. Anyway, when Stalin came to power, after you know, getting rid of uh, people like uh, Trotsky and Kamenev. I mean, uh, Trotsky went into exile, Kamenev was shot. He couldn't afford this uh, kind of picture to be seen, so he doctored the picture and said it was all done by Lenin with a bit of help from you know, himself. You see, this is the power of technology. You know, my 17-year-old old son can probably do this now with uh, Photoshop. But you know, at the time, this was a uh, secret technology possessed only by the KGB. Yeah? So people going around saying, you know, pictures don't lie. There was no such guy as uh, Trotsky uh, by the side of Lenin. Yeah? 
So it's something like this, uh, the, you know, the, in the history of capitalism, of course at the center was the market, but then there was also protection and regulation. But this uh, history has been totally rewritten, that we are told that it has all been done single-handedly by the market. I gave you a lot of information about this, and the crazy thing is that uh, you know, I didn't have to hack into the secret database of the International Monetary Fund or go to some Italian monastery to re read some secret uh, document from the 18th century, no. These are all available in libraries, on the internet, you know, books. But people don't look for this information because they don't even know that history has been rewritten. Welcome to the Matrix. Of course, uh, all of what I'm saying does not mean that Ghana can simply copy what the rich countries did in the past. Not least because the different countries, uh, the different rich countries themselves use different mixtures of policies. Eh? I already told you that Singapore relied very heavily on state-owned enterprises. In Japan, state-owned enterprises might have played uh, some important role in the very early days in the 19th century. But in the 20th century, other than in you know, the, the, the public utilities, uh, it, there was uh, no real, really significant uh, state-owned enterprises. You know, Korea used some, like POSCO, but not a lot, you know. I mean, some countries use that, 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 that sorry, regulated the foreign direct investment uh, very heavily, like Japan or Finland. Some welcome the, the, it with open arms, uh, like Singapore. You know, so the rich countries themselves uh, didn't use a uniform strategy. So it'll be quite silly for Ghana to decide that uh, yeah, that we like uh, Sweden. You know, we want to copy what Sweden did in the 1930s, or you know, let's that 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 dig up some document of a South Korea in the 70s and let's uh, uh, replicate that, no. But there are some common lessons uh, that can be drawn from the historical experiences and there are also many economic theories that you can use to make sense of these experiences. I mean, I cannot go into uh, this uh, that, that in my talk, but you know, I mean, Dozens and dozens of uh, economists sort of representing several different approaches uh, to understanding development. You know that you have all these that uh, that theories uh, that uh, help you make sense of uh, what uh, happened in this country. So, what are these lessons? Well, first of all, I think uh, it is uh, very clear that. Uh, in developing countries, protection and nurturing of infant industries is absolutely necessary for economic development. Although those uh, protection and nurturing can be provided in diverse ways. Yeah? So it doesn't necessarily mean tariff protection. It could be subsidies or you know, partnership agreement with uh, foreigners. But it is clear that uh, they need uh, this uh, period of uh, protection and nurturing, yeah? in the same way that we have to kid, uh, send our kids to school. Yeah? Secondly, protection is uh, necessary but not sufficient. You know, you have to send the kid to school if you want to make him a productive person, but the kid has to study. Yeah? That's very important. Yeah? A lot of countries have forgotten about that. They thought, yeah, if we give uh, protection to these guys, they'll naturally develop. No, they don't. Yeah? So you have to make it sure that investments are made in raising productive capabilities. I mean, this could be investments in machines that embody more advanced technologies, research and development, worker skills, general education, many different things, yeah? organizational knowledge. Yeah? Thirdly, <coughs> there have to be policies to promote export. You know, I go as far as uh, saying that economic development is impossible without good export performance. Right? Why? Well, by definition, you are a developing country. By definition, you have inferior technologies. 
So the only way to develop uh, the, the, your economy is to import advanced technologies. Eh? As simple as that. Of course, I mean countries like North Korea try to you know, do it independently. Yeah. I mean, this is a famous uh, proposition by the so-called dependency theorists in the 1960s and 70s. But that's a fantasy. Yeah? No, actually, North Korea did uh, some cool things, like you know, they invented the second ever man-made textile called vinylon. Yeah? And amazingly, this is made out of stone, made out of limestone. Yeah? How cool is that? Yeah? But how many technologies can you come up with as a small developing country? Yeah? Maybe two more, three more? So they live uh, under this uh, pretense that uh, they are pursuing some kind of independent uh, industrialization, economic development, while in reality they are basically running their economy from 1930s Japanese technologies and 1950s Soviet technologies. Yeah? It's a fantasy. Yeah? So you have to import technologies. Yeah? But in order to do that, you have to generate export of your own. Yeah? Yeah, you can get uh, a bit of foreign aid and so on, but you know, the main part of it has to come from your export. Yeah? Now, when I say this, people often say, yeah, therefore the, the we should do free trade. No, however, that is uh, the, the confusion. Because uh, the, the, to have good export performance, you need a lot of government intervention. First of all, export markets are very difficult to break into. I mean, they have a high entry barrier if you, uh, if I uh, use some uh, sort of economic jargon. So the government needs to provide a lot of help, you know, export subsidies. Unfortunately, this, uh, these are banned by the WTO these, these days. Um, but that, that, uh, also, the, you know, marketing support, yeah? help with uh, meeting various uh, standards, uh, the ISO, you know, the sanitary standard, phytosanitary standard. The government should also that, uh, share risk, yeah? things like export loan guarantees, because uh, especially if you're a small farm trying to export, there's a high danger that uh, your buyer might uh, the, not uh, pay you, yeah? and then you will be ruined. Yeah? So the, a lot of countries have introduced this uh, export loan guarantees that, uh, in which uh, the government will provide yeah, insurance basically for this kind of contingency. Yeah? The government could also encourage the formation of cooperatives among exports. Yeah? Uh, the most uh, interesting and successful example is uh, uh, the, the Colombian coffee brand uh, called Juan Valdez. Yeah? Also, a sustained export success will require a continuous supply of new industries promoted through infant industry program. Yeah? Because as soon as you become successful in some of these uh, the initial industries as an exporter, well, exactly because you have, be, uh, uh, have been successful, you will soon become uncompetitive. Yeah? Your wages will rise. Yeah? And you cannot uh, compete in this. Uh, this is exactly what happened in Korea. You know, in the 1980s, South Korea was uh, producing 90% of world Nike shoes. Because uh, at the time, it was a cheap, uh, the cheap uh, wage country. Yeah? But by the late 90s, uh, this uh, that, uh, was not uh, possible. Yeah? Nike kept uh, the shifting uh, production facilities to other cheaper wage countries because Korean wages uh, were rising. Yeah? Today, we produce only 2% of Nike shoes, yeah? only the very high-tech ones. Yeah? So uh, if uh, Korea just uh, said, yeah, we have cheap labor, we are going to uh, keep producing uh, cheap shoes or T-shirts or whatever, it would have been stuck in the, the, the 1980s. Yeah? It uh, has continued to develop, continued to have uh, export success because while they were earning money by exporting things like uh, Nike shoes, uh, they were investing uh, those money into next generation industries, yeah? steel, automobile, shipbuilding, and a bit later, semiconductors, mobile phones, you know, flash screen TV, and what have you. Fourth, in the early stages of development, it is inevitable 
that you have to exploit the agricultural sector. Because that's uh, the only thing you have uh, that, uh, that can give you the uh, uh, resources and labor to industrialize. Eh? But if you do that for too long, you'll be in trouble because uh, the, there'll be the, the, the problem with the food security, eh? uh, food price, inflation, you know, the balance of payment. So after a while, you need to uh, invest the, the, the resources back into agriculture by investing in uh, uh, rural infrastructure, agricultural research, extension services, and raise uh, productivity in the agriculture sector. And you can create a, a virtual circle because with increased productivity and thus a higher income, the agriculture sector can then provide bigger markets uh, for the infant industries. Okay, so these are some of the prominent lessons. I mean, that, that we can talk about many sort of subsidiary and uh, or less important lessons. Uh, so that let me finally sum up briefly before I uh, finish. So first of all, contrary to the so-called African growth tragedy discourse, metastructural factors like geography, climate, and culture cannot explain international differences in economic performance. Underdevelopment is not a destiny. Policies, are, uh, policies make most of the difference. Secondly, the policies that promote economic development are, are not contrary to the conventional wisdom. The free market are free trade policies, but policies like tariffs, subsidies, regulation, state ownership that protect and nurture infant industries. Almost all the rich countries that are from the 18th century Britain to late 20th century Korea used uh, these policies. All of them used uh, uh, some of these. Finally, you cannot just copy policies of the past, but there are plenty of lessons that can be drawn from history and there are various economic theories that can help you draw those lessons in an intelligent and nuanced way. And with these words, I would like to conclude my lecture. I hope uh, what I said today have been helpful in making you rethink uh, some of the issues concerning your country's uh, development prospects, even if you don't necessarily agree with uh, what I said. Thank you very much. A big thank you to uh, Hajun. Uh, let's open the floor. I'm sure the people who are. Uh, us about some of the issues. Please uh, put my hand and then we will call you. Uh, okay. Uh, yes. Go ahead. If you can, please come up and ask a question. Do we have a. Yeah. Can you please give it to Nanaya? And then Dr. Amwa is second. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming to address us. I taught at a Chess University and I used your book, Kicking Away the Ladder, as one of the core reading material for students. I have a question to ask about, you talked about policies and the importance of it. Leadership, what role does leadership play in being able to choose the right policies, being able to know when to mix the policies, and being able to move on? Because as you said, you can't just simply pick it up. Leadership, you didn't refer to it at all. Uh, Dr. Amwa, I'd like to Yeah, my name is Lloyd Amwa. Uh, I run the Center for Asian Studies at the University of Ghana. And I've been using your work uh, in teaching my students consistently. And sometimes when I raise some of the arguments you make, they think I'm mad, actually, uh, because it's so contrarian. And, and my question to you, uh, I've read virtually all of your corpus. Um, so you left Korea went to Cambridge. My question to you is, how come you became contrarian? Because, of a lot, because a lot of our elites also went west. 
but came back very free market minded, you know, which made possible the whole SAP and the rest of them. So, so what made you contrarian fundamentally? The other thing, you, you wrote a chapter uh, on doing the developmental state in South Africa, and you mentioned that for economies to transform, they don't necessarily need economists, they need smart people. Could you, I want to hear that from, from your mouth, actually. Yeah. Okay, let's stop right there. <laughs> right. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, first one, uh, leadership. Yes, uh, leadership is important. You know, I mean, uh, South Korea is a very good example there. You know, in the 1950s, uh, we had this uh, prison uh, who was uh, a minor mem member of the former royal family went to Princeton to study uh, in university when most Koreans uh, haven't even heard of uh, the, the, the place and married this uh, aristocratic Austrian lady. I mean, he was a fierce uh, anti-Japanese fighter, but apart from that, he was so detached from the real world. I mean, he was our Marie Antoinette, you know, when, when the, the, his agriculture minister told him, sir, that we have a rice uh, shortage in this country, there's going to be a crisis, he said, Oh, that's the problem with the Koreans. So all they want to eat is rice. Why don't they eat beef? You know, why don't they eat the wheat? You know, we don't produce those things, sir. Yeah. So the, when you have a, a leader like that, you know, you are not going to have a, a good economic development. So having said that, I think that we shouldn't that, 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 that turn this uh, emphasis on leadership into some kind of hero worship, yeah? because uh, people are products of their time. Yeah? So the, the, you know, the, the, our uh, kind of, uh, dictator, the General Park, I mean, he, I mean, in many ways that, that, that was uh, crucial in the development endeavor, but you know, my guess is that uh, if uh, that he didn't do it, someone like him would have uh, come along that, uh, sooner or later. He was also surrounded by his uh, advisors, uh, that he didn't do it on his own. Yeah? So I think that, that this is a, a delicate issue, but yeah, I mean, while emphasizing the importance of leadership, you should kind of try not to turn it into some kind of uh, a hero worship. Yeah? Could be collective, you know. Uh, for example, the, the look at uh, today's uh, Chinese leadership. I mean, there's no, I mean, after Deng Xiaoping, I mean, no figure equivalent to Deng Xiaoping or General Park or Li Guanyu, you know? but uh, the, the, the country still works. Yeah? So, you know, the, the, this is a, the, the tricky issue. Uh, how have I become contrarian? Um, that's a good question. Uh, no, I mean, uh, basically, it, uh, you know, I, I think it has to do with my attitude towards uh, life. I mean, uh, because you know, I have become an academic because I wanted to say what I wanted to say. You know, if I'm going to say something that I don't believe in, I should get uh, paid well, at least. Yeah? <laughs> no way I'm going to start uh, say what I don't believe in with a uh, British academic salary. Yeah? <laughs> All right. I don't know. Another reason might be my love of you know, trivia. I mean, I love to collect all this information. So, I mean, uh, when you collect enough of them, you begin to see that there's something actually wrong with this standard story. I didn't uh, uh, know this uh, uh, myself from the beginning. Yeah, no, I vaguely knew that uh, America uh, had uh, quite high tariff in the late 19th century, but apart from that, I thought that uh, Britain didn't have high tariff. I didn't know about Alex and Hamilton. It all kind of uh, uh, came to light as I was uh, groping around uh, to uh, understand the uh, economic uh, development better. Yes, uh, and finally, you know, th yeah, I actually, th 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 I said that in that paper, but uh, thank you for reading that. Uh, but uh, also in my 2010 book, uh, 23 Things, uh, even tell you about capitalism, I have a chapter actually titled, You Don't Need Economists uh, to Have a Good Economy. Eh? I mean, the, starting point of the story being that the government officials who engineered East Asia miracle were largely non-economists. Eh? I mean, the Japanese uh, the, the economic ministries were totally dominated by lawyers. 
they all came from the uh, Department of Law in the University of Tokyo. Uh, very cliquish and all that, but uh, you know, they were all lawyers. What little economics they knew were well, wrong kind of economics, but uh, the, because until the 80s, Japanese universities were dominated by economists who were followers of Karl Marx, uh, Joseph Schumpeter, I mean, basically Germans, yeah? So their knowledge of uh, neoclassical economics was uh, pretty rudimentary. Yeah? Korea, at least until the uh, 70s, a uh, similar story. You know, we had uh, more economists uh, than the Japanese, but uh, the largely lawyers. Yeah? Taiwan, Singapore, China, their economic bureaucrats are all scientists and engineers. Yeah? I haven't done it, but I, I'm pretty sure that if you when regressions between the number of uh, economies per capita and economic growth rate of a country, probably the relation will be negative. Eh? <laughs> no, once again, I don't want to kind of dismiss economics. You know, I am an economist. Yeah? It's a, a very a, a important and valuable subject. But the kind of knowledge that you need in order to run good economic policies are not the economics that you learn through textbooks. Yeah? You need uh, people who are smart, who have good judgment, who have uh, the, the, the kind of pragmatism, and that's uh, more important than whether this guy got an A in macroeconomics or the, the B in econometrics. Eh? Good afternoon, Dr. Ha Yun. My name is Nico van Staaldijnen. I'm from the European Business Organization. Originally born in the Netherlands, and that maybe explains why I'm in favor of free trade. Uh -huh. We were one of the most free trading countries in the world. Uh, I'm also a Ghanaian, and I was coming here to try to understand uh, your theories, but you rather managed to confuse me more than ever. <laughs> uh, you're an orator um, who's not scared of saying things which are contradictory of uh, what is sometimes in your books. Uh, but I would like to know one thing, uh, what I see a lot of times, and I'm commenting on, on problems and development of Ghana all the time, is that uh, I often see that people want to force the wrong choices in development, whilst we have so many other things in which we have comparative advantages. Mm -hmm. What I also see is that uh, if you start blocking certain industries, that other countries will block imports from your country by raising duties and all that kind of things. Do you have a solution or will you come with, uh, with other more confusing for yeah. me <laughs> answers? Thank you. Right, thank you. Well, actually, you know, the, your country was actually, well, I mean, I don't know the, your old history before the uh, sixth, uh, 17th century, but uh, at least after that, you have been the really only country that has been consistent in its uh, pursuit of free trade because, uh, you know, in the, the 19th century, your country even abolished the patent law on the ground that this is artificially created monopoly. Eh? We are a free trading nation which believes in the free competition. Why should uh, you give a, a monopoly to the, the ideas? Eh? So, yes, I mean, the, the, uh, definitely I uh, commend you for that. Now, the notion of comparative advantage, you know, the, this is uh, the, a kind of uh, often misunderstood idea because the idea basically says that uh, you might be rubbish at everything but there must be something in which uh, you are the least rubbish at and that's what you need to specialize in. Yeah? No, no, this is a very the, 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 the counterintuitive uh, but very powerful idea. You know, I'm also known to have said that 95% uh, of uh, economics is uh, common sense uh, made to look complicated uh, through the use of jargon and mathematics. But uh, this idea of comparative advantage belongs to that other 5%. Yeah? This is that, uh, some very important theory. Yeah? Because it means that even if you are not better than other people in producing something, you can still benefit from international trade. Yeah? And in the short run, this uh, theory is absolutely correct. Yeah? However, problem is that, 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 that you know, in the long run, okay, I mean, in theory, your comparative advantage uh, in the long run will change as you accumulate capital and 
you know, the, the, uh, your capital labor ratio changes and so on, but in just the, the, the more than the high kind of uh, the income, you, know, you need a whole new set of you know, the institutions, uh, the, the practices, organizational skills, you know, including timekeeping. Yeah? So the, 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 this uh, doesn't happen in the, such an automatic way, you know, because that, I mean, the, the, the theory basically assumes that, that there is no issue of uh, uh, productive capability. So in this theory, if countries like Guatemala are not producing things like BMWs, it's not because it cannot, but because it shouldn't. Yeah? That is a, a very problematic assumption in the long run. In the short run, yes. Yeah? In the long run, the real challenge of development is uh, changing the capabilities to be able to master and use those more complicated technologies. Yeah? Because uh, the whole theory of comparative advantage assumes that technologies are like uh, blueprints. Yeah? You can just uh, download it and uh, immediately use it. You cannot. Yeah? So while I the, 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 the spend a lot of time criticizing the theory of uh, comparative advantage, the theory is uh, the very important. Uh, and So I liken it to the compass. Eh? It tells you where you are. It uh, tells you where is north, where is south. Yeah? So uh, you have your comparative advantage and you want to do something different, then it uh, the, will tell you how much risk you are taking. And then it becomes a very good guide. However, the compass doesn't tell you where to go, how to get there. Yeah? So that's the kind of uh, strength and the weakness of uh, the theory of comparative advantage. The, the kind of protectionism I'm talking about is uh, what I call asymmetric uh, protectionism. Eh? So if you're the rich, richest countries, you sh shouldn't uh, protect your industries. Eh? Okay, I mean, even for rich countries, there might be some adjustment problems, local issues, you know, fine. I mean, the, the, you can do that. But in general, as you become the, 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 the problem, because the, the, otherwise you could get into this uh, war of, yeah? about uh, the, the, the escalation. So the, the understanding is that as you grow richer, you will have to lower your protection. In the same way that uh, we, when we raise children, we give them less and less protection and more and more uh, responsibilities uh, as they grow old. You know, my son uh, was six, I uh, was a parasite when the, the I wrote the book. Uh, now he's 17 and he's almost independent. Yeah? He'll uh, still be financially uh, dependent on me for another uh, few years until he finishes uh, university but after that you know I'm not going to protect him you know? so that's how you have to see it you know? yes, uh, oh you can see it thank you uh, I'm very glad to be here Dr. Chan uh, Dr. Messner said that if he if I got to know that you are coming here I will come by all means and, and he, he was right, because I've been trying to promote your ideas here unsuccessfully. <laughs> but uh, I'm no economist, uh, but uh, I came to the subject uh, mainly through diplomacy, where you, uh, through verbal gymnastics, to try to justify the wrong things you are doing. Now, uh, you said something which struck me. I believe that one of our main problems here in Ghana is that we have a mental uh, block. Uh, some may call it a fraud complex, I don't. But when we come across theories from the West, we lap them up as God's uh, sent troops. In this very room, a leading academic here said some years ago that the secret of the Indian success is free trade. Immediately I said nonsense. <laughs> uh, later on, he invited, we had a discussion, but he, he didn't convince me, I didn't convince him. Uh, I, and I told him, I'd been to India in 19, about 1968. There was only one type of car, more or less, on Indian roads. Now they are making others, and now the Indian economists would talk about free trade because they want to export their cars. So what you said is true. Why we don't see it, I don't know. We seem to have the complex. Uh, what the British say or what economists in the other countries say is that thing. But we have brains in Ghana who can fashion uh, economic uh, uh, theories. But when we are in trouble, we rush to IMF 
well, uh, adjustment, structural adjustment, this would go with it for two or three years and get stuck. And then we take another one. <laughs> and why are those who have done economics, those who are much more left than I am, do not see through it, I don't know. And I call it the major block in a complex on our brains. Uh, I work with Dr. Kwame Krumah, and he thought the first thing we should do was to remove those cobwebs and believe that we can do it and rely on Ghanaians. And uh, I would like to see uh, hear your views on that. Is that is it? Are we too much wedded to our imperialist uh, uh, past, and that we take what was said by our? Uh, uh, masters, and uh, that our uh, recent history has a mm -hmm. lot to do uh, with our present sorry state. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, I don't have any problem with uh, listening to the Westerners. You just have to do, uh, the, just have to listen to the right Westerners. Yeah? You know, Alexander Hamilton, Friedrich List. You know, these are all Europeans. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, of course, I mean, the, you know, the, the, the list that, that, that was a product of his time, so he thought uh, his uh, theories only apply to temperate countries, not uh, to tropical countries, but, you know, he was uh, uh, living in the 19th century, so you have to discount these things, yeah? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, you know, the, I, I mean, I, I, well, to put it this way, I mean, I think that uh, you should have the judgment as to which arguments are relevant. Yeah? No, because that the reason why people like List and Hamilton are more relevant is because uh, they were thinking about the same problems that uh, you are thinking about. Yeah? How do we catch up with the more advanced countries? Yeah? I mean, what do we have to do to develop uh, new industries when the British are already so well established? Yeah? So that uh, makes them the right Westerners uh, to listen to. The Westerners that you usually listen to these days uh, are thinking about different problems. Yeah? We are already developed. You know, how do we open up other markets uh, so that uh, we that, uh, create uh, bigger business opportunities uh, for our companies? Yeah? So that they are going to think about uh, totally different problems. Yeah? So you know, there's nothing wrong with uh, listening to Westerners. Just uh, listen to the right ones, yeah? <laughs> you, you oh, and, and uh, one, one more thing, and, and I think that, that, that basically out that, that on your second that point, beaten up uh, that, that, that they have uh, lost the uh, ambition, yeah? <laughs> No, I mean, it's actually quite strange because uh, when you read uh, all these uh, the kind of uh, self-help books and Disney, watch Disney movies, you know, they tell you that if you believe in yourself, there's nothing you cannot achieve. Yeah? But when it comes to developing countries, no, I mean, how can Ghana ever think about making cars, you know? I mean, it's uh, impossible, you cannot do that, yeah? But why, you know? Go back uh, 50 years, 60 years, they said that about uh, Korea, Japan, you yeah? know? Go back 150 years, they said that about the Germans. So, yeah, you could fail along the way. Not everyone's going to succeed. But the worst thing you can do is uh, to restrict your ambition from within. Yeah, yeah so if, if the biggest aim of yours is beat the Swiss in making chocolate, you might achieve it, but you are never going to beat them in making machines and industrial chemicals and so on, which are the things that make the country one of the richest in the world, and surprise, surprise, the most industrialized in the world. Contrary to what the people believe, Switzerland produces the largest amount of manufactured output per capita in the world. So aim high, of course you have to be realistic, you have to be pragmatic. You know, some countries have uh, tried to leave too much, you know, from growing rice that uh, they wanted to build aeroplane. Yeah? <laughs> well, the Indonesia tried that and it didn't work very well. Yeah, yeah no, but you have to get there a step. Yeah? Some of the Korean phone company 
I mean, it started out as a, a trading company selling fish and vegetable, and then it moved into textile and sugar making, and then into assembling the, the, the transistor radios and TV, moved into semiconductors, camera, and then finally the mobile phone, smartphone. Yeah? Nokia, the Finnish uh, company which once was uh, the, the dominant uh, player in the mobile phones, you know, it started out as a logging company. Yeah? So companies do that. I mean, they the, the, the have the ambition because if you, yeah, you could become the best logging company in the world, but in the long run, that will give you a lower income than when you are the, I don't know, seventh best at, uh, electronics company. So that's the, the, the how you have to see it. But in getting there, you have to be totally realistic. You have to make uh, certain jumps we have to take certain risk, but it has to be a calculated risk. Yeah? Pass it around there. My name is Gloria Fulkwedo. I'm a law lecturer at the Gimpa Business School. I'm also president of Women Assistance and Business Association. I noted your statement that the economic policies that promote growth are not policies that promote free markets and free trade, are policies that protect infant industries. Mm -hmm. We have a policy of one district, one factory in this country. And I've always wondered, instead of looking at foreign direct investment, why don't we also look at how to protect our infant industries? For example, the community of cane manufacturers, or a community of garry processors, or a community of basket weavers, or a community of poultry farmers, textile designers. I remember in the UK, they have a place called the Wingate Trading Estate, where small wholesalers and dressmakers are giving small stores to, to sew and supply markets like Harold's, Dorothy Perkins, and other labels. Can't we protect our infant industries, give them priority, instead of looking at foreign direct investment? I'm also looking at the issue of banks. The vice president has a book that indicates that over 70% of our cash in this country are outside the banking system. And there are a lot of struggling microfinance in the, you know, banks trying to get into the markets with all the governance issues and all the problems that we have with the Bank of Ghana. Wouldn't we encourage some form of protectionism, instead, you know, moping out all these capital from these micro, local and indigenous micro finance institutions to have a bank? The Nigerian banks have been coming here with their capital, South African banks. We could also lump them together, who knows, and also have our global banks. That's all I have to say. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, yes, I think uh, the developing countries this is, uh, have too much obsession with foreign direct investment. Uh, I'm not against uh, foreign direct investment. You just uh, have to write kind of it and uh, put the uh, right conditions uh, to push uh, the right kind of partnerships. Uh, because, you know, I mean, these are sources of uh, capital uh, manager skills and uh, the technology. But yes, I mean, the foreign direct investment, for the sake of uh, foreign direct investment, I think it's uh, uh, very problematic. And also, you know, foreign direct investment is uh, not going to be in very direct investment. The secret of the success is in, you know, using it uh, for national development strategy. So basically, they uh, try to attract the right kind of foreign uh, direct investment. So it's not like we are open for business, you can do the, the whatever you want. Yeah? No, they decide these are industries that we want to develop, these are the local capabilities, these are what we need. They go out, yeah? they talk to companies, they tell them, we can offer you this, offer you that, but uh, will you keep the... Uh, and uh, they can be very serious, you know, in that uh, tiny country, a city-state, they built another airport for purely for the purpose of uh, the developing an uh, aircraft maintenance industry. I mean, of course, it could do that because it owns 90% uh, of the land. 
would have been a nightmare if uh, the, it tried to create an airport without uh, having uh, the, most of the land uh, the, to itself. But, uh, you know, the, they go to the length, yeah? So it's not like, uh, you know, the, the come and do whatever you want, yeah? It's very much like, we are serious about this, please come, work with us, yes. And as for the, the, the issues of uh, small and medium-sized enterprises, well, you know, I, I would say the horses for courses. I mean, there are some industries where those enterprises are suitable. There are other enterprises, uh, industries where they have no chance. Huh? You know, you cannot make a steel or automobile in small companies, no. If you want to be a serious place in the automobile industry, you should be producing at least, at least that, that 300,000 cars per year. Hopefully half a million, ideally one million. Yeah? So there are some industries where the small enterprises are not uh, suitable at all. But yeah, insofar as they are, you know, there are many ways uh, to create a better environment, you know, the encourage cooperatives, you know, the, the, the create agencies to, that to join the uh, marketing, join research, you know, the countries, small enterprises in countries like uh, Italy and part of Germany and Denmark have uh, benefited uh, very much from this arrangement. What I'm getting at essentially is that, 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 that there's no blanket solution. Yeah? Each industry, each country has to have different strategies. Yeah? And in devising them, please, please uh, go out and uh, look at other experiences. Yeah? When someone has already yeah, thought about it, set up something, run it for 150 years, it will be stupid uh, not to exploit that. Yeah? So if you want to that, that promote that small farms, Go to the, send the mission to Italy, send the mission to the Denmark, you know, find out what they have done. Okay, three questions from there and then we come here to you. Thank you. Yeah. My name is Teiku Saba. And I work with Stag and I'm also a Mu Ibrahim fellow. Uh, so, so when you were talking, I was listening to hear about what is the role of democracy in development. And most of the countries that you give us examples, we don't see the traditional democratic principles at play, but they are developed. So if you take Singapore, for example, and Lee Kuan Yew discusses it in his book, looking at you know, European style development and how that um, affects it. So I want you to have um, a little expo expose about the democracy development angle. Thank you. Uh -huh. Another one. Okay, yeah, yeah, let's do that, yeah. Yeah, let's take a few questions together, yeah. That will be more efficient. Uh, my name is Kopina Eidu. Uh, now, first of all, I'd like to push back a little bit on your answer about the leadership question. Mm -hmm. Because I think it's a bit more important than um, you sort of suggest. Uh, because everything you've said is based on an assumption of rational, ethical leaders. Mm -hmm. Which is not always the case. So can have all the right brains around you. If the leader's heart is not in the right place, you're not going anywhere. And uh, you also mentioned um, Ethiopia in the beginning. And um, as you know, your state is very active in the Ethiopian economy, and um, which has partly led to the growth you've been experiencing. But on the other side, if you look at telecom, for instance, in Ethiopia, which has been in the government's hands, the state's hands for a while, and I've read estimates by the Economist magazine that they can raise about six billion dollars by liberalizing that sector. That's a lot of cash mm -hmm. to move their dam, to invest in agriculture, etc. So how does a country like Ethiopia strike that balance? Thank you. Right. Um, One more from that area. Uh, come to the here. My name is Akla Osoe, and I was struck by the fact that uh, brought your talk. You abstracted from politics and political economy. Mm -hmm. I'd like to go back to the question about leadership. Your response addressed the leadership from the point of view of the leader, correct the way to do it. But if you go beyond that, the question who makes the choices? What interests? A man goes choices. That was not 
Right. Yeah, no, actually, that's a nice uh, set of uh, related questions. Well, you know, in the end, I mean, uh, I think uh, all these questions about leadership, whether we are going to get the right leaders, uh, interest group politics, I mean, these are things that uh, make me even more emphatical in arguing uh, for a democratic route because well uh, first of all let's make it clear you know I have lived the first 27 years of my life under a military dictatorship I don't recommend it to anyone I think people recommend it only because either because they are military dictators or because they haven't lived under one yeah? it's a horrible thing yeah? we have to whatever its uh, problem is stick to democracy yeah? And having a good democracy, and with by this, I just don't mean uh, just uh, kind of people you know, switching off uh, for five years and turning off at the ballot box at, uh, at regular intervals. No, I mean, if you have democracy with uh, engaged and informed citizens, it is the best way to guarantee that you will get the best leaders. Yeah? Because, uh, yes, uh, leaders are human beings. I mean, they get tempted by, you know, the, the desire for power and money and so on. But popular pressure is uh, the, 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 the only thing that can keep them on the straight. Yeah? So I think uh, the, the democracy is uh, extremely important. And, but the, the, the reason why I didn't uh, go into these issues is, you know, uh, politics is very historically kind of uh, specific and uh, locally contingent. Yeah? Not knowing much about Ghana at all, I didn't want to presume, you know. I mean, if you want me to talk about the, the how Korean policies have to be designed in light of uh, its uh, political situation, I can talk about it, yeah? but not uh, about Ghana. Uh, as for Ethiopia, well, I mean, uh, you, you raised an interesting question, you know, how do you Kind of uh, make uh, choices between different things because uh, you know one view could be well telecom is uh, potentially a strategic sector you know it might be six billion today but uh, with the development of the economy the more mobile phones and so on it could be the, the 16 billion the, the 10 years later maybe that's uh, when we have to prioritize it yeah? so that uh, you have to all the time make this kind of calculation yeah? Because uh, nothing is uh, that, uh, only good and nothing is only bad. Yeah? And yeah, having, uh, if you privatize them, that, uh, raise it, that, uh, raise money, you also have to ask questions like, who are we going to sell it to? Yeah? I mean, the, the, is it uh, going to be anyone who's willing to pay the largest amount of money? Or is it going to be someone who's uh, willing to the, the, the provide the technological the, the transfer? Yeah? I mean, is it uh, someone who will partner with us uh, to move into new markets uh, in neighboring countries. Yeah? So you have to ask uh, these questions as well because uh, the, you know, uh, very often countries uh, that uh, make decisions on short-term basis when they do these things. Yeah? But uh, they have uh, very long-term implications and I think uh, that it's uh, very important that you know, in making these decisions uh, that you are not kind of uh, the, the tempted by the need to raise uh, short-term cash and you know when you do privatization on those grounds they often fail you know in the uh, 1990s a lot of Latin American countries privatized telecom company water company airlines basically to raise money in the short term yeah? a lot of these were bought up by well, unfortunately, the, the state-owned companies, not private sector companies, are from Spain. Uh, now, now they are privatized themselves with Telefonica and Iberia. And these companies basically the, ran down the, the Latin American companies. Yeah? So if you the, sell it out of the desire for short-term cash, these kind of things can happen. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Dr. Chan, for a brilliant lecture. The date you give this per capita is interesting and historical. Ghana, 1955. Think about 
$155 per capita, South Korea 91. What you failed to tell us is that between that time and about now, the Cold War gives special advantage to these Asian tigers. The level of American investments, which went to the Far East countries, so Africa as an orphan. None of this investment came our way. So the technology did not also flow our way. So you are talking about production of NAMIC and the rest of it, all in Far East Asia. Because, partly because the Cold War, Africa was literally avoided during the Cold War. We were really the orphans. And what you need to develop, as you rightly pointed out, is technology and investment. And all this had gone from the West to these countries. It was purely the geopolitics in the time. And I think when you put to it the level of investment in these areas, we may find out that Africa has been in serious difficulty. And we need also to have some godfathers along the line. I would say that it would be interesting for us to analyze movements of investment and technology during the period 1955 and 1973. All the markets in Europe were selling goods made from South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore. First and from where? These were factories in America that are there because of the so-called cheap labor. These were factories which wanted cheaper source of production. Africa didn't benefit from this production. Hence, that big difference between per capita that period and now. That is how I say mm -hmm. it. And I think we, 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 we need to be sympathized. <laughs> right, yeah, no, no, the, that's a very important uh, point, but I think unfortunately the, the, this idea that the Cold War politics was uh, important in the development of East Asia was uh, uh, basically developed by the dependency theories uh, which try to reconcile their theory that uh, peripheral countries will never develop and the fact of industrialization in East Asia. Let's uh, take this uh, one by one. Did Americans invest a lot? No, they didn't. Yeah? I mean, uh, South Korea and Taiwan had one of the lowest uh, dependence on foreign direct investment of any kind. Yeah? I mean, I can uh, uh, send you the data. I mean, it's uh, there. Why? Because uh, the Korea and Taiwan, while they actively quoted uh, foreign investors in certain sectors uh, like labor-intensive uh, export sector, in general, had very restrictive uh, the policies against uh, foreign direct investment. So that's uh, the, not the correct. And as the, the, there's also this view that the, the being clientel states of uh, the U.S. gave uh, Korea and Taiwan a lot of uh, foreign aid, I mean, the data for Taiwan is a bit patchy because of uh, its uh, the precarious uh, status in the international community. But, I mean, the, the Korea has uh, the solid data on this, and Taiwan has some data. Basically, in the 50s, they got uh, quite a lot of foreign aid. Yeah? But after the 60s, uh, their receipt uh, of foreign aid was uh, below world average. Yeah? It wasn't high. And also, the one thing that people often forget is uh, being the client state of the U.S. comes with a heavy price tag. Yeah? No, because that, uh, I mean, never mind that uh, you know uh, autonomy and independence. But we had to spend something like six percent of GDP on defense huh? when the international average is up, uh, something like two point five percent. So we may have got from that relation, we are paying very high price. Also, the, you know, locking up uh, the able-bodied young man that, that for two, two and a half years, three years, uh, depending on the period, into military service. Yeah? That's a drain. You know? So I don't know, I mean, I haven't uh, drew up, uh, drawn up uh, this uh, the balance sheet, but I highly doubt uh, whether the, it will be the highly positive. Yeah? So I think uh, that I mean, even while I agree with you that uh, that geopolitical conditions uh, played a certain role, I think it's uh, important has been that, uh, highly exaggerated.
So thank you um, for the interesting um, piece you brought to us. My name is Joanna Chamel and I'm with the Young Diplomats of Ghana. Um, my question is in line with the youth in policies. Um, you have mentioned um, in your presentation um, the fact that um, culture counts um, or culture counted in um, some of the developmental issues in some of the Asian countries in relation to Ghana. And I think cultural dynamism or culture. Um, so I want to know, um, or if you have any uh, views on that, what role do you think the youth plays in policies? Um, given the fact that in Ghana we also have a, uh, more of a community that does not really give the youth a chance, if I, if I can put it that way, because we have a lot of youth drain in terms of people going to school studying engineering and they end up in banks. Um, they study um, courses that they don't even use because in code systems do not work for them to be able to fully apply what they learn in school. Um, in terms of growing uh, infrastructure, businesses, uh, infant businesses, we have policies in place that tax holidays to foreign companies rather than local companies. We have... Um, Make short. Make short. <laughs> sure. So in, in court, what do you think the youth uh, can do in terms of policies and what Ghana can do in putting the youth on the table, uh, decision table making? Thank you. Okay. The gentleman, let's take those three people there. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is George. I'm saving the Dr. Chan, uh, I was your student. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, you used to tell us, when we asked you, yeah, you used to tell us the success of the, the policies that you recommended. was largely because in those countries, there were impositions of standards. Standard, sorry? In position of standard, whenever government uh -huh. provided support. That is one element that we have never had in this country because the kind of support that government provides is often selective and goes to people they know. And so it becomes difficult for them to impose those standards. Uh -huh. Would you want to throw more light since we have very important people in this room for them to learn about how they could do it in a more pragmatic way? Thank you. There's a little from there. Thank you. Sure, go to the first thing. Go straight. Isaac. My name is Celeste Mapoliani. It's with the Australian High Commission and another student of yours. Um, I... <laughs> um, very quickly, I want to know what you make of the argument that um, the, nature, the rise of globalization has really changed the nature of the game and so for developing countries, rather than trying to um, compete with, say, a Toyo or an Airbus, it would make more sense to find your place within the global value chain and scale it up from there. Mm -hmm. And so find, for example, for Boeing, de develop expertise in security systems for air uh, airline companies that everybody buys from you, something like that. Yep. Thank you. My name is Engineer Alex Kakutio. I work for Saint Copain, one of the companies that changed France. Um, Mr. Chairman, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a, a fact and, uh, which I want to say. A lot of us, our colleagues here, about 90% of them do not believe or trust a Ghanaian engineer that he can do anything for us. But these same engineers, some of us, as I said, work for St. Gopain, GE, Flows, train in this country. But we don't trust our own self. So this whole thing that we are talking about, we've mentioned, dependent on engineers, technologies, how they could help develop the nation. But this is the case, our policymakers do not trust that same engineers. So the engineers will end up working in banks, like our senior minister, who is a colleague engineer, who became a, a, a finance person, a banker. So my question is this, is there, is there a reason why we don't trust our engineers? Is it because they don't have good training? If they don't have good training, what policies will government put in place so that our engineers will have the best of training for us to try and trust them to help us develop our nation? Thank you. Whilst we're walking towards him, uh, in 
engineers don't have I mean they make good bankers. Sir. <laughs> engineers make good bankers. Yeah, Nothing yeah. wrong with engineers. Yeah, yeah. 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 Nothing wrong with engineers being bankers. <laughs> if you are choice. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Chan, for a very thought-provoking lecture. My name is Leslie Mensa, and uh, I'm an economist with the Institute for Physical Studies in Accra. Do you have any lessons to share with us about fiscal and monetary policies in development history? And would you also challenge the orthodoxy in this area that says uh, Lina is better? And on a lighter note, I've heard it said, you have heard it also, that you have not become full professor at Cambridge yet because of your views. Is that true? <laughs> no. Thank you. Not necessary. Yeah, no, I can dispatch uh, the last one very quickly. Yes, uh, it is uh, true. <laughs> but once again, you know, I mean, uh, uh, you know, I didn't become an academic in order to you know, do things that, that I don't believe in uh, to get uh, promotion. So it's fine with me. Uh, yes, uh, let's uh, this political uh, the history, but yeah, in many countries, uh, students uh, the, and youth uh, have uh, played a very important role in moving countries in different directions. Yeah? So in the, the attainment of uh, democracy in South Korea, the, the student movement played an extremely important role. You know, a lot of young German students were very much into, you know, reforming the society in the 19th century and so on. So yes, I mean, I think that, that, that the youth that, that have that played very important roles. Yeah, uh, yeah standards. Well, the, basically, the, you know, how I see it uh, is the, uh, the following. I mean, the, uh, in making economic policies, especially if you are trying to develop particular industries, you are bound to make uh, the selections. Yeah? I mean, you cannot have uh, completely even-handed policies. Yeah? It's impossible. It's pointless. Yeah? Uh, the owner of uh, GE1709, GE1709, you're blocking someone, so if you can move your car, please. Therefore, these uh, the, the policies become vulnerable to corruption, you know, manipulation, and uh, things like that. However, the, 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 it will be throwing the baby out of uh, with the, the bathwater if you then said, okay, because of corruption and all this stuff, we are not going to do these policies. Eh? What you need is uh, to set out the standards. Eh? So you have, uh, have to have uh, some kind of long-term vision statement. You need to have uh, overall direction of industrial policy. You need uh, the, the position paper on the sectoral policy so that people can check government policies against uh, these uh, stated uh, principles. Yeah? Oh, you said that you are going to promote this, but why aren't you doing it? Yeah? You said that you are going to do this by providing uh, the, the, company, uh, the subsidies to companies that do research and development, but uh, you are giving money to this company, which is not doing that. Yeah? I think uh, that uh, it's very important to set out uh, that those uh, rules and standards so that uh, the, the policies can be constantly checked. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Now, has uh, uh, globalization changed uh, the, the possibilities of development? Well, first of all, you know, this idea of a uh, global value chain, you know, I mean, the people the talk as if uh, this was uh, invented in the 1990s. No, South Korea was already involved in global value chain uh, in the 1950s and 60s. Yeah? They were assembling uh, TVs for American companies, assembling transistor radios for Japanese companies. Yeah? However, the important thing is that, that, that you do not uh, satisfy yourself uh, with uh, being you know, the, the best of uh, the third, fourth tier uh, supplier. You should uh, the, try to climb up. Probably is that uh, in certain industries are uh, impossible, like uh, aircraft, but in many industries it's possible. 
the most uh, salutary example is uh, the South Korean electronics company LG, the, uh, the rival of Samsung. LG started out as a, the, the, well, I mean, it was in many different businesses, but when it comes to electronics, it started out uh, the first as a the assembler of uh, transistor radio, and then became a the assembler of uh, the basic black and white TV for the American company RCA. The, the, the interesting uh, story is that, uh, the, uh, I forget uh, exactly when it was, uh, 2000 something, it actually bought RCA. Yeah? Yes, uh, so the, this uh, global value chain doesn't mean that you have to be always at the bottom of the, the food chain. Yeah? You can climb up, you should uh, try to climb up. Yeah? But having said that, yes, I mean, that, that, you know, don't get too hung up on you know, producing the final product. You know? I mean, there's nothing kind of uh, inherently virtuous about being able to assemble the airplane or the car, you know, and if you become the best uh, producer of certain subsystems in the aircraft industry, it may not you know, allow you to uh, see all these uh, planes that, that are flying around with the, 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 the logo of your company, but you, know, you are making uh, good money, you are the, the creating good jobs. Yeah? So, you, know, uh, the, you have to the, have a clear assessment of uh, the, what you want to do, what is possible, and if uh, the, such and such is your goal, the, how you are going to get there, in what kind of time frame, doing what. Yeah? Engineers, well engineers are good because they are very oriented towards uh, solving problems. Yeah, yeah no, they, they are trained for that, that uh, in that kind of way. Yeah? But, you know, unlike Economists will say, well, on the one hand, on the other hand, so much so that, so much so that, that, that Harry Truman, the American president, said, I wish that all economists had only one hand. <laughs> because these damn guys come to me and say, on the one hand, president, on the, uh, on the other hand, Mr. President, I'm confused. Huh? So engineers are good in that way, but uh, unfortunately, the, the, the downside of engineers is that uh, you know the, they are too mission oriented. Yeah, so they do something if they can do it. Yeah, they don't ask questions as to whether they should do it or should not. Yeah, so you need uh, different types of people. Yeah, you need engineers. You need philosophers. Yeah, to raise uh, fundamental questions about yeah? uh, our life. You need the, the, you know the, the, the different people. I mean that's uh, what will make uh, the, your you know, company or government cabinet or policy team or the company board are stronger. Eh? No, let me tell you a very interesting story in that regard. You know, uh, the Nokia. I was uh, talking about Nokia. You know, the, uh, I was uh, once uh, listening to the speech by the someone called Mikko Kosonen, who was uh, one of the nine mem uh, members of this uh, legendary managerial board that. Uh, catapulted uh, Nokia from an obscure uh, Finnish company to a global company. And he was uh, talking about this uh, issue of uh, diversity. Yeah? He said, well, you know, when you go to American companies, they say they love diversity. Yeah? And truly, uh, when you go into their boardroom, it is really diverse. Yeah? I mean, uh, there are three women, uh, one Korean, you know, two black guys, you know. One Mexican, you know, one Lithuanian, great. However, there's no diversity. They all went to the same five business schools, all learned from the same textbooks, they all talk alike. Yeah? Our company, we had uh, nine members, only one woman, all Finns of uh, between 45 and 55, all went to two of the, uh, the, the well, the basically they have uh, two great universities, uh, Helsinki and Turku all two universities, so outwardly we are so homogeneous, but we were very different. Yeah? One guy was a philosopher, another was a poet, you know, the, the, there were two engineers and the, one economist, and we fought all the time, yeah? because we saw the world from completely different perspectives, yeah? and that's what gave us our strength. Yeah? So while I love engineers, you don't uh, the, the, want the, the, the team that is uh, completely the, made up of engineers. Yeah? Finally, fiscal and monetary policy. You know, the fiscal and monetary policy. I think uh, you know the, these are policies that 
are very circumstance dependent. Yeah? So sometimes uh, the, you know, the deficit is good, sometimes deficit is bad. Yeah? Sometimes uh, the, the balanced budget is good, sometimes it's uh, bad. Yeah? So and, and the, 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 when you are running deficit, why are you running deficit? Are you borrowing money to invest in education, infrastructure, health, which will raise uh, productivity in the future? Or are you uh, the, the borrowing money to build uh, some stupid monument uh, for the president? Yeah? <laughs> you have to ask those questions. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. I, my, my comments are in two parts. I want to come back to the Cold War question. Because mm -hmm. I don't think that was satisfactorily answered. Because in the case of Ghana, the suggestion is that countries such as South Korea develop outside of a regional context. That is, in a region where there were policies at the international level that made investments, made decisions about breaking up land ownership in South Korea, in Taiwan, in Malaysia, Singapore. That the point that we missed is that a country like Ghana cannot develop outside of a larger regional framework than what exists today. The second part of my point has to do with the question of reparations. To what extent did reparations from the Japanese to the Koreans affect the consciousness and self-confidence of the Korean people in terms of their educational system and hence in terms of economic policy? And would it not be necessary for some reparatory justice to be part of the planning of the society such as Ghana in relationship to the destruction that came from the slave trade and colonialism? Yeah. Long last, it's my turn. Yes. My name is Manuel Kofi Asari. I'm working with Rolls Royce Power Systems in Germany. Um, our CEO has a forum where he talks to the staff and the different staff members, four times a month. Where the staff members portray to him problems we they have in the company, their ideas, and so on. And um, I was lucky to have a discussion. I would like to have with him a discussion once where I asked him, I actually don't have a question but a comment, where I asked him, uh, if I look on the map uh, where we produce our products, Africa is only represented with South Africa. And I told him, don't you think it, is, um, it will be good to go to other parts of Africa? And his point was, we always meet restrictions. Several things disrupt our business. Definitely corruption, as number one. So um, I think our leaders have to really do something about it. We have to create measures for people to be able to invest in this country. And my last point will be actually we need, really it comes up to a good leadership a visionary leader who will be able to pull up his sleeves, go out into the world and talk to companies. We don't need leaders who will be sitting in the office the whole time. They have to go to the international companies and talk to them to be able to invest in our country. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple of guys in front of Dr. Chang. My name is Echo Hackman. It's a short one from me. Don't you think that one of the main problems which we face as developing countries, especially after viewing your expose on successful countries, is we have a weak public sector. And public sector which 
doesn't aim for best practice and world-leading standards. And that perhaps is in the absence of, uh, rather than looking at which systems we're implementing, whether free trade or state-backed uh, enterprise, is probably more important. Mm. Following that, since we had Dr. Chan here, he said so many things. Can you uh, leave us with an advice as to how we should uh, train or educate our economies and uh, burden development experts uh, so that we know that there was not only a German musician called Lisp, but a German development economist to whom a monument has been built in Germany? Thank you. Right. Uh, yeah, I didn't quite understood the, the first uh, part of uh, the question. I mean, the, when you say the, the, the first question, the, when you say how, I mean, the Afri uh, Ghana has to develop uh, within a certain regional framework, what do you mean by that? Uh, that cannot develop outside of the unity of Africa. Right. I mean, the, well, at one level, no one can develop outside, well, unless you are North Korea, the outside the world system. So, the, yes, I mean, the, the each country's uh, position in the system puts uh, certain constraints, uh, open the certain opportunities. Yeah, so in that sense, I the, the, the agree that, the, you know, Cold War politics and so on was uh, relevant. But, you know, the, 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 my point was that, that the, it's uh, not clear to me whether it was uh, such an important uh, factor in explaining the success of uh, Korea and uh, otherwise of uh, Ghana and other countries. Uh, repression, well, the, the Japanese uh, gave us a bit of money in the, the 1960s, but you know, I'm uh, sorry to say, I mean, they have never truly apologized. So I, I, I doubt whether the, the most Koreans uh, think that uh, the issue has been resolved, yeah? because uh, a lot of people uh, think that uh, the Park government in the 1960s basically sold national pride uh, for a little bit of money that, uh, yeah, I mean, did give us the steel mill, but uh, the, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the issue of justice was uh, never uh, resolved. Yeah? And yes, I mean, I am all in favor of uh, the Ghana and other countries that have uh, suffered from uh, slavery and imperialism and uh, all these atrocities uh, uh, to get uh, reparation, but I don't think uh, it's a realistic uh, prospect. Eh? You know, when the, you have uh, the British uh, Prime Minister uh, David Cameron going to Jamaica and saying, it's time to move on, yeah? Move on from what, you know? No, this uh, the issue of uh, historical injustice is with us. It will be with us uh, forever, yeah? But uh, with the uh, Western leaders with that kind of attitude, I think it will be a waste of time uh, trying to get reparation, yeah? In the meantime, but uh, it's uh, better to... It's not the money. It's not the money. What it did to the consciousness of the Korean people. Yeah, no, no, but, uh, you know, Koreans uh, think that uh, the Japanese rule was uh, totally unacceptable, you know. I mean, but, you know, the, 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 if they really, truly apologize, you know, money is uh, secondary, they truly apologize, we might have accepted uh, their apologies, but they haven't. So, you know, let's not get into that. Uh. I don't want to create a diplomatic incident with uh, Japan. Uh. Uh, I think uh, your point about the quality of the public sector is vital. No? You know, the, the point is that you have hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of uh, private enterprises. You have only one government. No? If that doesn't work, the consequences are very widespread. No? So you have to get that right. And if you look at the, the countries that, that, that succeeded with the economic development, Britain, the, the France, Korea, they, uh, Germany, they all, at the beginning, maybe not at the very beginning, at the beginning they reformed the government bureaucracy. Yeah? Introduced a meritocracy, yeah? 
recruited the high quality people, you know, the created the, the sense of national purpose. Yeah? So I think that uh, yeah, if you have to focus uh, on the, the, the one thing, I think that has to be yeah, the thing. So I'm uh, very glad that uh, you uh, raised that point because uh, if uh, the government uh, the officials are incompetent, whatever policies you use, they'll not be done well. Yeah? So the, the how do you create the, this uh, the, 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 uh, good bureaucracy? You know, the, 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 you know, once again, I uh, say that, uh, you know, that good bureaucracy that, that doesn't mean stopping people with uh, PhDs from uh, Harvard and Cambridge, you know, I mean, you don't need them. I mean, uh, but uh, you need to train them in the right things, you know. I mean, you know, train them in, I mean, the real economic policies. Yeah? I mean, that, that, that make them read, uh, say, Alice Amstel's book on the South Korea's economic development, The Next Giants. I mean, it's already 25 years old that, that, that she's that, that passed away, but, you know, Reading those kind of things that, that, that you will realize economic development doesn't happen in some magical, automatic way that you see in textbooks. Eh? Send these people to other countries to find out that, you know, I mean, it's no good that, that, that going there asking, how did you do it? No, I mean, that no one knows, yeah? But to find out about the specific things, yeah? You know, how, how are you develop this uh, industry. I mean, the, how did you reform the government uh, the, uh, bureaucratic system? Uh, how, how did you uh, develop your infrastructure? Huh? So that, uh, send them to successful countries. How did you develop your agro-processing? You know, God knows what, yeah, whatever you want to know. Invite uh, people from those countries to tell you how the, they have done things. Yeah? I mean, there are a lot of uh, kind of retired uh, uh, kind of underemployed uh, government officials uh, in countries like uh, the Japan and Korea, you know, you could uh, get them, but uh, they'll be very glad to come and uh, the talk about this. Yeah. So you know, I think that, that, that in addition to yeah, I mean, training these people in you know the fundamental technical skills like statistics and what have you, you also need to expose them to uh, history to experiences of other countries, you know, send them out, invite uh, people in uh, to create uh, the, a cadre of people who really know how to do these things. Yeah? Because as you all know, I mean, that, that, that in every field, I mean, even in engineering, I mean, the textbooks and university education can teach you only so much. Yeah? You actually have to go to the factory, run things, experience failure, learn from your experience, talk to other people to be able to run a decent factory. Yeah? Same with the economists. Yeah? I mean, or why do you think that, that, that just getting someone that, that with a PhD from Oxford or that, that Yale would that, that solve the problem? Yeah? You need the people who know how to do these things. Yeah? Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome, Dr. Chan. Um, I've enjoyed your talk, and uh, I really was enjoying your forthrightness, except when uh, you seemed to defer to diplomacy, and uh, also uh, you virtually objected to sounding like dabbling in politics. But the truth is, if you are talking you of national development, you know that's what the whole thing is about. So uh, and you do not touch politics. Oh, then, or when you are not being outrightly forthright. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, the topic is destiny or policy. And I agree with you entirely that it's not destiny. If it's policy, policy is worked not a mass, not in the streets of the place. It's worked in government. Mm -hmm. And governments are led. So you must get the leadership with that open uh, public sector of information, of uh, global appreciation and dedication uh, to move, help move leadership 
uh, to lift the quality of life for the people generally. Mm -hmm. When policy works like that, it's implemented sincerely for the good of the people, then you are getting transformation for everybody within the polity. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you didn't want to talk leadership, and you didn't touch governance, I said, for once, the good doctor is began, beginning to sound like a bit limp or lame. Uh, so uh, the policy, yes, and especially now, because the whole globe is one market. And uh, the African Union, for instance, is talking of the new partnership for Africa's development. Why? Because they see that we are in the era of PPP, public-private partnership, to move growth, to grow wealth, without which, even with the best intentions, the social interventions won't work for people. You don't transform. And the partnership is not limited to domestic or to Africa, the continent. We should welcome people from Korea, from America, mm -hmm. whoever would come and we negotiate fairly for win-win uh, with a vision, of course, then we get sustainability. Mm -hmm. So, uh, kindly, next time, open up. <laughs> Don't limit yourself to just the technicalities. Don't begin to sound like the tunnel vision engineer. <laughs> One way, open up and talk politics, talk leadership. You mentioned Dong Xiaoping. Suppose he hadn't come on the scene in China, perhaps the people there would still be wearing the uh, denim tunics and wouldn't be able to distinguish between the men and women. Suppose think, um, about your uh, collegiate uh, of Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew, suppose he hadn't come. Singapore perhaps would have developed, but perhaps not to the extent why the whole world is acknowledging Singapore. Check even the neighboring Malaysia. They needed uh, Mahathir Mohammed. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so around here too, uh, I believe we've got the people. What has been lacking is the leadership that would uh, use the public sector, build the public sector, for the public sector to become aware that it should form the infrastructure to move the private sector, which must be overseen, of course, so that at the end of the day, we build the resources for the people at large within the community. Thank so thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I uh, fully take your point. I mean, it's uh, just uh, that I didn't want to presume because I don't know much about uh, Ghanaian politics. So. <laughs> thank well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you, thank you, Dr. Chan leaves uh, this evening. I think uh, from here. Uh, he's already checked out of his hotel, so we're just going straight to the airport, and then uh, we'll be at Cambridge tomorrow morning. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, and we thank you.